So I want to start this morning with a story. Um, when I was a, a kid, a long time ago, not, you know, se seems like it, it's getting longer and longer ago now, but I was probably eight or nine years old. My, my brother and I, we, we grew up on a 40-acre uh, a farm, and in a barn that sat back behind our house, we found a, a wooden block pulley. And when you're eight or nine, this wooden block pulley is massive and it's heavy. And, but anyhow, we had this fabulous idea that we would build a zip line. And uh, we had just, uh, had, my dad had some chicken houses constructed on the property and they had taken all the stuff that was left over sat at the corner of this chicken house. And then we had stacks and stacks of one by material, uh, screws, nails, and, and this little quarter inch cable, spools of cable. And so what we did was we went out into the woods and we found two trees that, that grew neck parallel next to each other. And my brother began taking the one bys and we cut them down and we nailed a ladder right up the side of this tree. And so we, we, t we tied the cable off on the ground to another tree. And we even had cable clamps, you know, we were, we were doing it right. And so he gets about 15, 16 foot off the ground and he ties the top of the cable off to the top rung of the ladder that he's nailed to the tree. With, the, with this heavy pulley on there. Some of you know where this story is going. And so I'm, I'm, I'm the little brother. So I am, I am the, uh, the historian in this uh, affair. I'm, I'm taking notes and I'm watching. And, and so he climbs, he climbs back down the ladder and t awkwardly turns around with this, this pulley up above his Helen's cable. He gets both hands on it and, and, he's, and he kicks off. And as soon as he does, the little inch and a half nail that was holding that rung into the tree just pulls straight out of the tree. So he comes out feet first and he lands flat on his back on the ground and I'm sitting there and I just, <gasps> you hear it, you know, the thump in the air, like, he, <gasps> like a fish out of water. And don't you know, because of the, the momentum and I don't know when he let go of the pulley, but it followed him down and landed square in the middle of his chest and he just, he just goes, <gasps> you know, and, and, and I remember laughing profusely, he could have died and I'm thinking this is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And, and the crazy thing about that story is, if we fast forward 25 years later, I'm sitting on the back porch at my mom. He lived, just, just to put you all at ease. I, I'm not sure it caused brain damage, <laughs> but he lived. So, thir you know, I, I'm, th I'm in my mid-30s, mid and I'm sitting on the, the back porch at my mom's house, and my, my dad's brother's there, my uncle, and we're talking about some stuff, and somehow the pulley comes up. And when he was a kid, he tried to make a zip line too. I, I don't think he was any more successful than, than we were. And, and it occurred to me that I need to get a wooden block pulley, some rope, some screws and nails, and put it in a box and put it down somewhere in my house. Because I got two boys. And I know, I know when they find this that they're, they're, going, to, they're going to pick it up. And that's, that's the title of our message today. It's Pick It Up. And what we see in life is that uh, we pick up stuff, right? We pick up stuff from our parents. We pick up stuff from our peers. We pick up stuff from our, the culture that we live in. Um, we're currently living in a, a victim culture. Um, and there, there's, you know, and... and you don't think that, that it impacts everybody, but it does because it's part of our culture now. It's part of the way people speak. And, and you see it with kids, you know, that they post things on, on Facebook that uh, your generation would never have said to anybody ever, not alone written it down somewhere. And why? Because culture has a way of putting things down and we, we pick it up. And so we see that things change by what's put down and what we pick up. And today, we want to look at something that Jesus put down. And we're going to be looking in the Bible. I, I don't think I have it on there. I can't see that far. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, it, we find Jesus is talking to a group of people. And then Jesus called to the crowd, to himself, and along with his disciples, and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. So pick it up. That's, that's the TLV version. I like using that. Your Bible might say, take up your cross and follow me. I like pick it up because pick it up worked for me today. So pick up your cross and follow me. Pick it up. You know, you can search your Bible from cover to cover and nowhere in it will you ever hear Jesus defining uh, uh, gaining eternal life 
by saying, uh, just repeat this prayer after me. How many of us heard that at some point in our life in our context of Christianity? Just, you know, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be saved, repeat this prayer after me. Jesus doesn't say that, but he says a lot of things like uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, there's some things that you have to do. You have to say, pick it up. So let's try this. I'm going to, on the count of three, we want to say, pick it up three times, okay? One, two, three, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. A little bit slower than that. I realize I talk fast. All right, so it's, it's church. We're participating. We're in this together. All right, one, two, three. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. All right, now I want you to use your imagination because I want to I amp it up a little bit. So I want you to imagine that the Huskers are on the field. It's the fourth quarter. There's like two minutes left. The pass is thrown and the ball has been fumbled. It's a close game. This could lose it for them. One, two, three. Pick it up! Pick it up! Pick it up! Right? It's a little different. When, you know, and this is the thing. When it comes to picking something up, it, we can win or we can lose. And, and you know what? We want our team to win desperately with everything in us we want them to win and sometimes it's so close but anyhow getting off subject so Jesus wants us to win now winning eternal life is is a little different we have to define what we mean by win because Jesus has won right it's like we know the end before we start so that's a little different than, than a football game. I mean, you might have a pretty good idea which way the game is going to go based on the past. But when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to Christianity, we've already won if we believe in Jesus. So we got to clarify this, and this is very important, and it ties in with what Pastor Paul preached on last Sunday. And one of the things he said that really stood out was that if you're, you're in a performance based relationship with Jesus, your thinking is wrong. Listen, there's, there's nothing that we can do to earn favor with God, and there's nothing that we can do to lose favor with God. It, it's, it's all faith-based. You, you have to believe, and you know, some people ask Jesus one day, what must we do to do the works of God? And what does Jesus say? He says, you must believe on him whom he has sent. It's faith. It's all faith. So I don't want to mislead and, and get itch thinking, well, we got to get out. We got to do something. We got to do this. Because what we do is, is way less important than why we do. Why we do is always more important than what we do. And, and we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Why we do is more important than what we do. Let's see if I got a slide. I do. I should have. I didn't write down my slides, so I'm gonna have to guess if I got one. That it's not what we do. It's why we do. Think about that for a minute. It's not what we do. It's why we do. It is by grace through faith that you are saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. It's why we do. But one thing that we come to that we have to see is that if we have faith, we will work. Because James says that faith without works is dead. Faith without works does not exist. Faith without works is like having kids and a clean house. It doesn't exist. It's like having a newborn baby and being well-rested. It does not exist. It's like owning a boat and having money. Some boat owners in the audience? It doesn't exist, right? The thing just is this and this and this. It's like being in high school and not being affected by peer pressure. It doesn't exist. Faith without works is dead. And so we have a litmus test of sorts that can reveal to us some things that are going on in our life. Um, and it's important that we can wrap our heads around this and see that to do the works of God is to believe in him whom God has sent. And if we believe that, if we believe that, then, then we will do some things. If I came to your kitchen window at, at 6 o'clock this morning and you're sitting there sipping coffee in your PJs, uh, looking at the TV, maybe you're watching the news, how bad the weather's going to be, whatever. So let's say I come to your window and, and I, I'm knocking on it, and, you know, and I bat, 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 and your house is on fire. 
That, that's what it sounds like from outside. Your house is on fire. So if I came to your window, or if there's some crazy guy outside your window knocking on your glass saying, your house is on fire, your house is on fire, you have a response to that information that you can make. There's a choice that has to be made there. You can call the police. This guy's obviously a lunatic. Um, you can get up and get out of your house or get grab your fire extinguisher. You can react according to the information that you had. You can move by faith. He said, my house is on fire. I believe him. I'm going to do something. Now, if you just sit there and you're like, you obviously don't believe what I'm saying. And so what we see is that faith without works is dead because if we believe what Jesus is saying, if we um, think about God's grace and the gift of salvation, it is impossible for us to sit there on the field when the ball is laying a couple feet from us and we can win the game. And God's saying, pick it up, pick it up. This can change everything. It can make life new. It can make life great. It can save other people. If you take heed to your life in the doctrine, you will save yourself self in those that hear you. We can build the kingdom of God by doing one thing, picking up what Jesus Christ has put down. And this is a new identity. I want to talk about identity this morning. Identity is such a crucial and important thing. Uh, there's, a, there's an old story about a, a thief that was breaking into a house. He'd been casing it out for a couple weeks, and he was absolutely positive that they had left for the evening. They were gone. And so he's there. It's nighttime. He's got the window open. He puts one leg into the house, and all of a sudden, he hears a voice saying, Jesus is watching you. And man, terror just washes over him. How can somebody be in the house? And he sits there completely motionless, not breathing, listening, straining to hear. With all. And finally, he concludes that he is losing his mind, that it might, he just hurts. Have you ever done that? Like, you knew you heard something, but you convinced yourself, no, I didn't hear nothing. So he steps the rest of the way in his hat, into the house, and he shuts the window, and he's about to take another step into the room when he hears the voice again, Jesus is watching you. And man, this time he about loses it. He fumbles, he grabs his flashlight, he shines it at where the voice comes from. And there in the corner of the room, he finds a parrot. And at the bottom of the cage, there's a nameplate that says Moses. <laughs> he is so relieved. He walks up to the cage and he says, what kind of people name a parrot Moses? And the bird says, the same kind of people that name a Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> All right, identity. The identity of Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Savior, Son of God, you know, the, the, the ruler of the universe, is different from the identity of a Rottweiler, which is why that joke is funny. Howbeit we should fear God more than a dog. Think about that. <laughs> but the dog is more present and real to the thief in the room, so we get that. So that the identity is different. And here's the thing, as a born-again believer, if you accept and believe in your heart and mind and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, by all points and purposes, you, you, you shall be saved. You are saved. You know, If you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you can say that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are saved. That means you've been born again. This is a new identity. You used to be somebody else, but now you're somebody new. And by all intents and purposes, a lot of times we wear the name of Jesus Christ, but in reality, our nature is more like a Rottweiler, right? I mean, you know, we can be intensely loyal and loving, but grab my food while I'm eating. Step on my foot and see what happens. You know, and think about that. Are we more like Jesus, turning the other cheek, uh, loving those that are unlovable, loving those that hurt us, loving those that would do harm to us? Or are we more like a Rottweiler and we love those that feed us as long as they feed us? But don't come in the house to the window or it's on. So think about that. Are we more like Jesus or more like the Rottweiler? So as a believer, you have two identities. You know, you can think of that as being schizophrenic, but that's not exactly what schizophrenia is. It'd be more like a, a dual personality disorder or something like that, where, you know, you're two different people. And the Bible tells us this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It says that the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do what you want. You're conflicted. 
You've got conflict going on in your life because God said, you see who God is, you see what God does, you see uh, the identity of Jesus Christ that we are trying to be like. And then there's me, you know, wake me up in the middle of the night. (laughs) All right. So this new identity is something that we have to pick up. God's put it down. Jesus has put it down. We have to pick it up. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. If we are going to be changed, we have to actively pick it up. There's something that we have to do. Do we believe what Jesus says and pick it up? You know, in a key way, we can see what's going on in our life, uh, uh, kind of like another litmus test, is to see if we suffer from curly syndrome. How many of you have heard of curly syndrome? Think three stooges. I'm a victim of circumstance. Right? How many people know that line? I'm, I'm a victim of circumstance. So this, this is Curly Syndrome. And listen, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we should never, ever, ever, ever believe that lie that we are a victim of things happening randomly around us. Because it, it is a lie. Ephesians 4, 4, 11 through 14 says... So Christ himself gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And listen to this. This is Ephesians 4, 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind. Or of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people and their deceitful skimming, scheming. So here it is, curly syndrome, blown back and forth by the wind. I'm, I'm using a little bit of liberty on that verse, of what it exactly means, but I, let's think of it this way. One day Jesus is in a boat crossing the water with his disciples and a storm comes up and the waves are huge, the sea spray is huge, the wind is wicked, it's nasty, crazy, and Jesus is taking a nap, sleeping like a baby. But how do his disciples respond to this circumstance? We're all going to die. We're all, let's wake up Jesus. And they run and they wake up Jesus. And what we see is that Jesus had no fear of the circumstance because of who he was. The disciples thought they were going to die because of who they were. It's not what we do. It's why we do. Why did they wake Jesus up? Why were they blown by the winds of circumstance? Because they were afraid they were going to die. Because they they thought that there was something that they could do to save their life. How many of us get trapped in that trap of thinking, well, I need to do this and I need to do that because i got to provide for my family. I need to do all these things over here. And what we end up doing is we're trying to save our life apart from God. And the Bible clearly tells us that if we try to save our life, we'll lose it. But if we lose our lives for his sake, if we will deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him, we will save it. We have to be careful that we understand the difference between a a circumstance and a consequence. Life has consequences or things that we do that, that can come back at us. Um, consequences are caused by ourselves. Circumstances are beyond our control. Um, I had my kids one day this summer. It was probably 85 degrees. It was pretty warm. And we're on a corner lot, so we have a flower bed, and we had planted some uh, caladiums in it and some other things. And the weeds were growing better than everything. So I had them come out to help me clear out this flower bed. It should have taken us maybe 10 minutes. I got four kids. One of them is four. I wasn't really counting on her to help too much. So I said, hey, come on real quick. We got to get this done. We were planning something fun that day. We wanted to go and do something with the kids. And man, you should have seen them. It was, and and you've probably, if you've got kids, you've probably seen it. They come out of the house like, You thought, you, thought I had, like, you thought I was loading them on the train for Auschwitz. I mean, it was the saddest thing I had ever seen in my entire life. 
it's like from here to that door away, from the door of our house to the flower bed, and, and like we're, we're, we're not even a quarter of the way, and I've got two that have to go get water, or they're going to die right then. They cannot possibly take another step through the Sierra of our front yard. They are on death's doorstep if they don't have a drink. And I mean, it's, it's like, it's meltdown level. And, and, and like, I mean, I've seen parents that are cool when they know how to handle kids like that. I, I'm not the right one for this. <laughs> Because I, I tend to go militant. You will do it, and you will do it now. You will love it, or else I will make your life so bad. You'll wish you had it worse. You know, that's, that's, that's my go-to. I'm trying to change. I'm trying to pick up that new identity. So, so this, this is what we were doing, and that's why, you know, they're kids. Why, what, why were they doing it? Well, they didn't want to do it. They wanted to do something else. They wanted to lay on the couch. They wanted to play games. So anyhow, I, I contrast that to a month later, we were camping uh, down at Branched Oak, and there's this huge bush behind the camper. For like four hours, they trimmed out and hollowed out the center of this bush and c carried limbs to the nearby woods to make a fort, laughing, joking, carrying on, having a good time. It's not what we do. It's why we do. And, and as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as their parents, I am putting something down into their life. I want to ask you today, do you love what you do? Do you love what you do? Because if you're the person that's griping and complaining and I have the worst boss in the world and this is the worst place to work and they don't do this and they don't do that, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a victim of your chance, right? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> We're putting down something that's not, not true to who, what our identity should be, right? Because as a, a follower and believer of Jesus Christ, we should love what we do. Um, one of my favorite science fiction writers is Orson Scott Card, and he's got a, the Alvin Maker. One of the things that I really love about books is that, you know, you can watch a, a movie or something, but you can't, you can't illustrate, I mean, as best they can, to illustrate what is going on in the heart. You, they have to perform it. But in the book, the author can tell you. And one of the things that he says about one of the characters in his book, he says, he no longer did his work for its own pleasure, but rather for the pleasure of the thing the work can provide. Think about the nuance of the difference. He no longer did what he did for the pleasure of doing what he did, but he did it for the pleasure of the things that he could get by doing what he did. There's a difference. There's a huge difference, and it is so much dependent upon our identity and who we believe God is in keeping with, in step with God's word and what the Spirit says. Um, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Let's see if I've got this. All right, why we do will always be more important than what we do. Here we go. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, th this is the word of God. It, it's it's in the form of a command, whatever you do, whether you're helping your dad clear out the flower garden, whether you're helping uh, a neighbor uh, get down the steps, whether you're changing tires, changing oil, whether you're working on contracts, whether you have a job that pays $150,000 a year or $5,000 a year, whatever you do, it does, there's not an exception clause. Well, if, if you're a, uh, an indentured servant or a slave, well, then you can be, no, it, it, whatever you do, there's no exception to who you are, or what the conditions are, or what the circumstances are. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Put your all into it. Give it everything that you got. Don't be divided about it. Give it your full attention. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Working is for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive a reward, an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Identity. Who do you love? Who do you love? Who are you working for? Who are you, who are you serving? The way we respond to circumstance reveals what we serve, who we serve. It's a litmus test of identity. 
Each and every day, we are picking something up and we are putting something down. So I handed out an index card. And what I would like for you to do, if you so choose to do, you can. If not, you can make a paper airplane out of it. Uh, you can put your grocery list on here so you know what to get after church. Um, whatever you want to do, really. But what, what I thought it would be neat to do is to make an ID card. An ID card, an identity card. This is, is who I am. This is who you are. And so if you want, you got a pen, you got a card, we can write this down on there in some form. But this is what it says. I am a child of God. If, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe that, that he was the sinless son of God, that he died on Calvary's cross for your sin. what you are. You have a purpose. You're a child of God. You have a purpose to do good works. And listen to this. You have provision. God will abundantly provide everything that I need for the work he has for me. And here's the fourth thing. The circumstances of life have no power over me because Jesus has all power and authority and nothing comes into my life without his permission. That's the ID card. That is the thing that we need to pick up each and every day if we're going to navigate life in such a way as an individual, as a community, and as a church that we're going to put something down that can radically change the community in which we live. This is who I am. So I'm going to walk through this. Um, if you're writing this down, I'll put it back up later. Or I'll put it. I'll put it on the Facebook page for the church, um, if if because time restraints. You know how it is. So new identity. We want to pick this up. So I want to give you some Bible verses that kind of. This is where this comes from, and this is something that you can go through and study on your own. So Ephesians uh, two ten. For we are God's handiwork. You are somebody's workmanship. All right. We are God's handiwork, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Listen, the Apostle Paul is outside your house while you're in your PJs sipping coffee, and he's knocking on the window. Hey, your, your house is on. This is the same thing. He's saying something to us that demands a response. We are created by God for a purpose, okay? So that's your first thing. Our second thing is found in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having uh, all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Isn't this the most amazing thing you've heard today, right? Not only has God created you and defined you with a purpose that you're created to do good works, but he's going to provide everything that you need abundantly to do the works that he's called you to do. So listen, we don't have an excuse. You can't say, well, I'm not skilled or I'm not talented or I'm not a public speaker. No, God has specifically given you in abundance everything that you need to do to do whatever it is God has called you to. You just have to find that calling. And that calling can be found in life. It can be found in being a mother. It can be found in holding down a nine to five job. It can be found in starting uh, your own business and being an entrepreneur. It can be found in ministry. It can be found in any area of life. But it starts with the question of God, what did you create me to do? Am I doing what God created me to do? See, that's identity because now you're not looking at, well, this job pays that much and I can make this and I can have this kind of lifestyle. No, you're asking the profound question of who am I and what did God create me to be? That's identity because I am a child of God and I want to fulfill the calling and purpose that God has placed in my life. I don't want to circumvent it for something that I think will be okay because that's not even second best. It's last best because what God has far exceeds anything that I can think or imagine. It's, it's, it's a life that transcends life. And, and until the church starts transcending life, we will be no different than the rest of the Rottweilers. God gives us purpose. God gives us provision. And finally, circumstances have no power over me. Jesus was taken to a trial, a mock trial, 
and he was falsely accused and condemned to death. And he finds himself with the, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And Pilate's in a weird situation here. He's trying to keep the peace. He's got a boss that he answers to. Circumstance, the wind of circumstance is blowing hard. He doesn't want to execute Jesus, but then again, he doesn't want any kind of revolt that would cause him to lose his job or his life. So here he is, he's with Jesus, and he needs Jesus to talk to him because he's trying to figure out a way not to have this, uh, an innocent man executed. And he says to him, he says, don't you know that I have the power to set you free or to execute you? And what does Jesus say? You would have no power over me if it weren't giving to you from heaven. What we see is that circumstance had absolutely no effect on the life of Jesus because he knew that God is in control. That there is nothing that comes into his life unless God allowed it. And if God allowed it, there is a reason for it. And there was a reason for the cross. For this reason, Jesus came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to pay a price. He came to satisfy the righteous anger and judgment of a holy God so that you and I and every person who will believe can come and be co-heirs and heirs with Christ and inherit God's divine nature. We can have a new identity. We can be different. We can live forever and we can start today. You know, the Bible, there's a verse in the Bible that says, endure hardship is this one. It's one of my favorite verses. You know, I think there's, there's a difference between discipline and punishment. Punishment is paying for a crime that you've done. That's all. You're just paying the piper. Time served. Discipline's different. Discipline, there's, there's an end to discipline that I want you to learn something from this, that there is something in this that you can learn because you need to learn. The Bible says endure hardship is... What hardship? Hardship that, that is my fault? Hardship that's no fault of mine? Any hardship, all hardship, endure hardship as discipline. Because God's trying to teach us something. Because there's something that he's put down in this world and he wants us to pick it up. We need to pick it up. I, you know, I think that the main thing holding back explosive growth for the kingdom of God is their unwillingness to claim our identity in Jesus Christ because we don't know who we are. We've got to pick it up. Another favorite verse that I have is to examine your life and your doctrine closely for you will save yourself and those that hear you. There's so much, there's so much promise in that verse. There's so much power in it. And God's saying, if, hey, if, you know, I want you to take up this cross. I want you to hear what I'm saying. If you hold to the truth, if you listen to my words, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free and your freedom's involved here. I want you to win. I want you to pick it up. I want you to be victorious. And, and this is my prayer as we go into this is that as a church, as believers, that we can, we can pick up this new identity that we can pick it up, that we can put it on, that we can be transformed through the renewing of our minds, that we can pull down every thought that exalts itself against our knowledge of God, that we can deny self, pick up our cross, not to be saved, but because we are saved. The Bible says that we are victorious, that we are more than conquerors, that we are loved, that we are gifted, that we are beyond worth, that we are children of God, that we are gifted, that we are called, that we have purpose, that we are heirs and co-heirs of Jesus Christ. God is saying, you've got this. You can do this. I will never leave you or forsake you. I want to see you take the ball and run it all the way to the end zone. Fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, lest you become weary and well-doing. Pick it up. Focus. Get back on track. A new identity starts when we believe that Jesus loves us, that he gave his life for us, and that he rose from the dead. Pick it up. We are picking up so much stuff from culture, from friends, from peers, from television. 
Are we picking up who God says we are? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Father, today as we come to look at this identity that you, you're holding out to us, Lord, we pray for your power. We pray for the spirits working in our hearts that you would help us to accomplish this, this work of sanctification, Lord, making us become more like you. Lord, help us to just pick it up today. Help us to walk in this newness of life, Lord. Help us to be invigorated with your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.